Good morning. Today is Monday, December 18, 2023. Last Friday, Israelis and Jews around the world learned the most tragic news we have heard since October 7th. And as more details emerge, the tragedy grows. Three Israeli hostages somehow managed to appear in a street in northern Gaza. Either they escaped or they were abandoned by their Hamas guards. And they wanted IDF troops who were right there to rescue them. And they did everything possible to make it clear that they were Israelis. And nonetheless, somehow, IDF soldiers assumed they were terrorists and shot and killed them. Chief of Staff of the Israel Defense Force, Lieutenant General Herzi Halevi, immediately said, the IDF and I as its commander are responsible for what happened. And we will do everything to prevent the recurrence of such cases in the continuation of the fighting. And as soon as the IDF figured out some of the details of what happened, they immediately sent new protocols to ground forces to try to prevent, God forbid, this from ever happening again. But without excusing what happened or minimizing in any way, Halevi added, we do have to understand the context. He said, I tried to place myself in the head of the soldier in Gaza after days of hard fighting, close encounters, encounters with terrorists dressed in civilian clothes who arrive in various deceitful ways. And that Israeli soldier must be alert and ready for any threat. A split-second decision can result in life or death. In one moment, the complexity of our just war in Gaza was revealed. Defense Minister Yoav Gallant also immediately accepted responsibility as the head of the defense establishment. He's the Minister of Defense. And also, without minimizing or excusing in any way, he said we do have to recognize the circumstances and the environment in which our soldiers are operating. He said, sometimes recordings are played with the sounds of an infant crying behind a door in a house in order to lure soldiers into apartments and then detonate explosives. These are events that have taken place and that continue to take place. Inevitably, this terrible event raises the critical question and gives the impetus, more impetus, to those who argue that this intense military campaign is, number one, endangering those who are still being held captive, as well as questioning if or how often this happens with civilian Gazan victims. One reporter said, if Israel kills even those who surrender and raise the white flag, these three men, Israelis, were holding aloft a white flag, the universal sign for surrender, This person said the narrative is a condemnation of the Israeli army. But 
The question needs to be asked. I want to share with you part of a remarkable article that appeared in Times of Israel written by Michael Oren. Michael Oren is the former Israeli ambassador to the United States, member of Knesset, deputy minister, and what he wrote was extremely revealing and important to hear. He said in the aftermath of this news, hearing about this made many Israelis question the conduct, if not the fundamental sense of this war. Now he did note, and this is very important to understand, that 20% of all all casualties in Gaza are attributed to what is called friendly fire. And that's not just in Gaza, and that's not just the Israeli army. That is every war, every army, about 20% of all casualties come from what is called friendly fire. That's just a, it's a ter the, the term is a terrible oxymoron, Michael Oren says. But accidents and mistakes, it is inevitable. He writes, it's not like you watch in the movies where there's one soldier shooting at another soldier and the other soldier is shooting back. The cliche of the fog of war is not only figuratively true, it's often literally true. Under the pressure, when you're being shot at and you don't know where it's coming from. And let me just say, I, I want to make it clear, I have never been in any kind of situation like this. But Michael Oren has served valiantly in the IDF. He also says that he wants to discuss something that he has never discussed publicly before. He said on the night before Israel's ground offensive in Gaza, Michael Oren met, went to meet with his old army unit and these are now young soldiers, just a few months out of training, and they're about to go into Gaza in battle. And he went to speak to them. And he writes, they were afraid. These beautiful children turned overnight to adults. And they kept asking me, in war, what is it you feared most? And Michael Oren writes, I didn't have to consider my answer. Cowardice in the face of the enemy was not my greatest fear, and neither was letting my buddies down. My nightmare, I confess to them, was shooting one of our own. And he tells two stories one of which, when he was a soldier, he almost committed a friendly fire where, without realizing, he was shooting, this was in Syria in 1982, and it turned out <clears throat> that the soldiers he was firing at were his own comrades, the Israeli soldiers, and Thankfully, he says that he did not hit or injure, certainly not kill any one of them, but it was very close. And he said years later, he still has nightmares about what almost happened. And he also tells the story of when he was almost a victim of friendly fire. Again, this was outside Beirut. 
he said he and a group of soldiers came under fire and they called in for air support. And thankfully, very quickly, a number of helicopters, attack helicopters came to eliminate the enemy in front of them. But they dropped the bombs prematurely. And they landed in the middle of his group of soldiers. He was not hurt. But two dozen of his comrades were killed. And he writes, Friendly fire, the inescapable oxymoron, that horrific contradiction in terms, is unavoidable. And he further writes, each case of friendly fire causes two casualties, the dead and those who are sentenced for life. It has already been reported that the soldiers who shot these three Israeli hostages in Gaza were operating against orders. Now, of course, that is being investigated, and I certainly don't want to come to any kind of conclusions before a full investigation is done. But if it is proven that they indeed disobeyed orders, they will be held accountable. The news and, but at the same time, the news has already reported that the soldiers who did this have already been transfer, transferred for psychological counseling. Because those who released the bombs and those who pulled the triggers will have to live with that moment perpetually. So in the wake of this tragedy, I am filled with questions and worries. To what extent are Israel's actions putting hostages, Israeli hostages, at greater risk? And to what extent should that be a factor in its military strategy? Have Gazans suffered similar deaths that we just don't know about? What more can and must Israel do to protect civilians in Gaza? I have no answers. I have no expertise in this. I certainly don't make any judgments at this point. But I don't sleep at night. There is one premise, however, that I am sure of. Israel must succeed in removing Hamas as a terrorist threat. And let me express this to you with a chilling, frightening story. A few days ago, there was an article in the New York Times. It's, well, you'll judge for it yourselves. Chain Goldstein Almag, 48 years old, she and her three children were kidnapped on October 7th. Her husband and her oldest daughter were murdered on that day. She was a hostage for seven weeks. She was released as part of the negotiations recently. And she says, she, she said, the strangest part of her seven-week ordeal was the long, almost intimate conversations she had with her captors. One of the gunmen holding her even apologized for the killing of her husband and one of her daughters by other Hamas gunmen. She said, he said to her, it was a mistake and against the Quran. 
Now, I want to make it clear, I am not in any way suggesting any kind of excuse or attempting to minimize the horror of what Hamas has and continues to do. She did say that at every moment she was in fear for her life, she never knew such fear was even possible. At the same time, she said that she and her surviving children, so it's a daughter 17 years old and two sons, 11 years old and 9 years old. Imagine the four of them being held hostage for seven weeks. She said she and the children were held together and they were treated respectfully and not physically harmed. But she said that over the course of various moves during their captivity, she had met with other hostages who were badly treated, including two women who said they were sexually abused. She said her conversations with her guards sometimes went on for hours. Maybe because she was once a social worker and knew how to keep someone in a long, deep conversation. Her only way of trying to make sure, she said, that she and the children would be safe, as safe as possible. Nonetheless, she said, we were in daily danger. It was a fear at a level we didn't know existed. Now, all that is the introduction to what I want to share with you now. The last paragraph of this article. Please listen carefully. At the end of their captivity, so she had, she had created this uh, relationship with the guards, this ability to speak to each other in a human manner. Again, I'm not... I don't mean to suggest any minimizing of the horror and the atrocities that these people did. But she was able to develop this. Listen carefully. At the end of their captivity, the lead guard turned to this woman, Chain Goldstein Amag, and gave her a warning. This guard, this Hamas guard said to her, don't go back to your kibbutz, which is just outside Gaza. Don't return to a place so close to Gaza. Go to Tel Aviv or somewhere farther north because we are coming back. the most precise expression of how I feel today and how I would like to suggest we all think about this and where we are and where we're going is a quote from a woman in a very, very different context but so precisely apt to this moment. It was said by United States Justice of the Supreme Court, Sonia Sotomayor. And she said, there are days where I get discouraged. There are moments where I am deeply, deeply disappointed. And yes, there have been moments where I have stopped and said, is this worth it anymore? And every time I do that, I lick my wounds for a while. Sometimes I cry. And then I say, okay, let's fight. My friends, I wish you a good day. 
And I look forward to seeing you soon in person.